Well, good day to everyone who is viewing this uh, interview. Uh, I am Larry Myers, currently the chair for the scholarship subcommittee of Rotary International, <clears throat> Rotary International District 6270 here in southeastern Wisconsin. Today we have a special treat because I'm going to be interviewing one of our former Global Grant Scholarship uh, recipients. Uh, his name is uh, Leif Van Grinsen, and uh, he will tell us uh, everything about himself, uh, well, applicable information with regard to uh, the Global Grant Scholarship that he received uh, from the district and, and Rotary International, the Rotary Foundation, back in the years of 2019 uh, to 2020. He is a native of Southeast Wisconsin, grew up in Cudahy, Wisconsin, right south of Billy Mitchell Airport here in Milwaukee, and uh, attended Wheaton College. But I do not want to um, uh, uh, take away his information. So welcome, Leif. Uh, glad to have you with us. <clears throat> he is, uh, is zooming in uh, from Malawi, Africa, where he currently lives and works. It is um, about 4 p.m. plus in the afternoon in Malawi. And it's just after 8 a.m. here in uh, southeast Wisconsin. And he's actually the first person with whom I've spoken today. So I'm still getting the croaks out of my throat. So please <laughs> excuse my, my coughing. So welcome, Leif. God, glad to have you with us today. No, thanks, Larry. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to share about uh, the role that Rotary has played in my life and, and what I'm up to these days. Well, terrific. Let's get to it then. Uh, first of all, how did you learn about the, the Rotary Global Grant Scholarship Program? Yeah, so I've known about Rotary growing up. Um, I would say what I knew about Rotary then versus what I know about now, obviously now is a lot more. Um, but I knew Rotary, especially the a lot of um, business friends involved. So so older individuals who are within my, my parents' network who were involved with Rotary, uh, who were very entrepreneurial individuals leading communities and a lot of the businesses that they did. I heard about the global grant um, actually through my uncle um, who was involved. He is a, um, a principal and then now a superintendent. And so he, he was very familiar with um, scholarship opportunities and um, he knew my background, he knew my interests and he thought that my interest both in business and in, in kind of community involvement along with that that international interest kind of paired really nicely. And so he um, he referred me to it and it, it, it worked out amazingly, honestly, with where I was. I think I learned about it my junior year um, of college and then it ended up being my senior years when I when I applied then. Did you find it difficult to apply for the scholarship? No, no, the application um, is fairly straightforward. What I would say the 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 difficult part of it is is understanding what you want to do right and so i think scholarships in and of themselves and, and the rotary scholarship is, is it was not a difficult um, application per se if you know what you want to be going for and what, what you want to be doing and so what i would say is it's, it's honestly it was a very healthy time when you're coming up uh, you either in college or you're about to graduate or or you're um a year or two out and you're looking to study more it's a very healthy time honestly to reflect to say to yourself what have I studied? What am I passionate about? What do I now want to do with my life? And Rotary was a perfect fit. It fit in really nicely there. And so for that reason, the application was not difficult whatsoever. It, it fit really you know, nicely. And we'll talk more about my area of focus and what I studied in my background. But because it fit and because I knew where I wanted to go, it, it was um, fairly straightforward. Well, then that, that leads to uh, the next question. Uh, would you please share with our audience uh, what is your specific academic background and, and interests? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I was at Wheaton College, I studied, uh, I was an interdisciplinary studies major, which essentially means that I combined um, multiple different academic fields to focus on a particular issue. And so the, the term we used was a wicked problem. The idea with interdisciplinary studies is that um, oftentimes the, the issues, the challenges that we face um, today are not easily tackled from one discipline. It's not simply economics, or it's not simply political science, or it's not simply health that might be able to solve an issue. Oftentimes an issue has a lot of compounding factors that come from a lot of different academic disciplines and a lot of different um, 
yeah, complex problems. And so interdisciplinary studies centered around combining these disciplines together. And so what I focused on was essentially the link between international disaster response and management with the long-term development of a country. So I looked deeply into say when, when crises happen, when moments that kind of turn our world upside down happen, how can we actually leverage that opportunity because it's direct, disrupted everything to now set up, set forward a, a new way of doing things that is actually better for, for, for what we're doing. And so I did economics and international relations to tackle that. Um, and, um, I've honestly, in, in many ways, have continued along that trajectory. And um, what Rotary actually allowed me to do is really strengthen um, that that's field of research um, when I was in the UK. Okay, well, thanks for that. Uh, <clears throat> when when a, a student um, or, or potential uh, scholarship recipient applies for a global grant scholarship, uh, you, you mm -hmm. have to try to really connect with one of Rotary's uh, areas of focus. There are seven areas of focus currently, and um, it, it's not that not all that difficult to take one's chosen career field <clears throat> and to fit it into one of the seven areas of focus. But the more closely aligned one's chosen career field is to a specific area of focus, mm -hmm. the more successful the candidate is going to be. So uh, for your program, uh, you chose the area of focus that we call economic or community and economic development. That was your area of focus. Uh, why? So one thing I'll say is that building on interdisciplinary studies, I think, and working throughout my, now my, my time in Malawi and in Rwanda before, what you see is that, you know, systems problems require systems solutions, that very, very complicated issues can't be tackled from one area, from one perspective. And so for that reason, I, I commend Rotary for having these multiple areas, uh, these disciplines, these areas of focus that you can have, because it allows you to essentially to jump into the issue from one area, but it also allows you then to kind of dive deep enough that you can start to, to see the interconnectedness of all of it. And so um, I chose economic and community development. My my experience in in um, Pakistan, in India, and in China, I had gone for for various activities. Um, some of them were social enterprises. Them. Some of them were entrepreneurial training. Um, some of them were simply um, health or educational kind of lessons. Um, but at the end of all of those those workshops, at the end of a lot of those these experiences that I had, oftentimes that what would happen is people would come up at the end of the workshop or they would come at, up at the end of the research and they would say to me, look, this is all really great. I love what you've taught, but do you have a job? And so it, it, it seemed to me that throughout at least a lot of my experiences that the question that kept coming up is, do you have a job? Is there an opportunity for me long-term outside of this that I can continue to provide for my family? And so I chose economic and community development uh, um, ultimately because I, I wanted to dive into to job creation. I wanted to start to figure out how we can create jobs, um, how we can start to create um, opportunities for people that are willing to work hard. The other side is the community development side. You know, ultimately I believe um, that for us to be able to, to move forward um, with people, it ultimately comes into buy-in. It comes into people believing themselves that this is actually something good for them. And so the community development side as well is, is critical to what, what I do currently in Malawi, which is to say, this isn't just a solution proposed by me to then give to you. It's a solution and it's an opportunity that we've really co-created together. And so the economics and the community side, I think, pair really nicely. And it allows us to, to begin to start to tackle a lot of these very complex issues. I think economics and having an affordable job, you're suddenly now able to, to afford health care. Right. You're suddenly you, you have more money. You can afford health care. You have more money. You can send your kids to a better school. You have more money. You can afford to um, buy cleaner, better food or cleaner drinking water. You know, when you're able to when you have a, a sustainable income, I think it allows you and it doesn't doesn't necessitate. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll lead to all these other things, but it allows you to have the opportunity in many ways to then um, advance in, in other these other areas. So economic and community development, I think, has been something that. I did with Rotary. 
I had a background in it and it's something that I'm still doing today, but ultimately it's, it's the start of addressing these, these larger system problems. You can't just stay at economics and community development. You have to address health. You have to address education, but you need to start somewhere. I think Rotary is, is great in getting, you know, a young person to start somewhere and then you can really run with it as you start to mature and, and grow professionally. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. One of the requirements uh, to be accepted for Rotary Global Grant Scholarship is that you have to be accepted in a graduate program of studies overseas, meaning not in one's own home country. Uh, for your particular graduate program, uh, you chose graduate studies at the University of Sussex in Southern England in the United Kingdom. Would you please share the specific program in which you were admitted and uh, and why you chose specifically the University of Sussex? So I attended the University of Sussex, and then within University of Sussex is housed the Institute of Development Studies. And so University of Sussex and the Institute of Development Studies, they come together to offer the master's degree that, that, that I then pursued and, and received. Um, Institute of Development Studies mm -hmm. is the premier research um, leader in international development. Um, as well as the, they, they have the number one, they're pretty consistently ranked the number one research institute in international development in the world. And they also have consistently the number one master's program in it as well. And I think the reason for it is, um, is twofold. One would be the diversity of the students and the faculty that they have. Um, and we're talking people from all around the world, the, the friend groups that I was in and the research groups that I was in and the, the, the class projects that I had, we're talking about, um, you know, I, I had friends from from Kenya, from Lebanon, from Laos, um, from the Philippines, from Mexico. We're all together in a research group tackling and addressing, trying to trying to tackle some complex issues and, and kind of discuss them. And to have those perspectives made the program extremely rich. The other thing I would say is the diversity of the, 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 the focus. When you think about international development, you think about the challenges that that are being faced around the world. You might focus on on a certain aspect. You might focus on uh, an environmental issue. You might focus on health. Uh, you might focus again on on economics. You might focus on a governance. But what's great about the Institute of Development Studies is that it it has these sub masters. Where essentially, you can get a master's in governance. You can get a master's in food security if you wanted. But at the same time, you can get a master's in international development that allows you essentially to, to take the best of each of these programs, the best of the professors, the best of the research, and really get a, a quick glimpse. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's, it's a short, it's a, it's a year long program. And so essentially a lot of these students that do the master's then do the PhD because they kind of, they, they, they get a taste for this sort of research, but the diversity of the understanding, the, the, the width, I guess you would say, and the breadth at which they do their research it helps you understand, I guess, the complexity of international development, the, the, the diversity of the issues, the interconnectedness of the issues. And then it, it kind of pushes you out to say, look, we've equipped you with some of the tools you need to tackle them. But really, you know, you're going to if they were really so tackleable, we wouldn't all be here studying them. Right. If they were really so easy to 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 address, we wouldn't all be here. That takes your career then to really dive into it. So um, the program was was stellar. And then I would say. Um, yeah. Uh, also, it's it's the southern England. We're along the beach, and so it's it's a beautiful place as well. I I didn't really know that before I applied uh, to Sussex, but it became an added bonus uh, hanging out along along the beach in the summertime in England. Well, thank you for explaining that. <clears throat> From my perspective, one of the uh, greatest strengths of the Rotary Global Grant Scholarship Program is that we can provide uh, Rotary support to uh, applicants, to candidates that are chosen, uh, uh, guiding them, mentoring them, assisting them in the application process with the Rotary Foundation. And then even overseas, uh, we have a host Rotary Club that is supposed to be kind of the sponsor for the uh, graduate student and to uh, make sure that their needs are being met and to get them involved in uh, everything possible with regard to Rotary. Now, that, that then leads me to, to my next question. Um, you, you had somewhat of a unique experience in that 
your your graduate studies were right at the beginning of the global pandemic and COVID-19 kind of shut down things for a long time. But in spite of that, uh, what, what were your experiences with that kind of support that I just described, the support that we try to provide uh, from within Rotary, both here in Wisconsin and then in, in the UK? Yeah, I really appreciated it. You know, Rotary compared to maybe other scholarships, I think one of the big advantages that you have is that you're not being simply sent on your own to kind of sort everything out and just try to figure it out as you go there. Really, what you have is you have a, a sender and a receiver. And so you you really get to you, you're not going completely blind into a country. You're not going without any contacts, any any um, any friends, really. And, I've, I, you know, as someone who's traveled a lot and have gone have gone in blind to places you see the value of that very, very quickly. And so in my experience, it was great before even going to the UK, meeting with um, with you and meeting with the other Rotarians as I started to prepare to go out to that journey, getting connected then when I landed in the UK, pretty much immediately with the, the Rotary Club there. Um, even before COVID hit, um, we had gone to some local Rotary events um, uh, in, in England, which was very exciting. Uh, getting involved there. I attended actually their their Christmas party, which was extremely exciting. Um, the The English uh, celebrate Christmas a little bit different. A lot of lot of caroling. Um, if you know the Christmas poppers as well, was a was a big hit. Um, but I had a great time. Felt like I was part of a community, even though I was pretty much new to a, a completely new country and a completely new program. So having that, and it might seem small. You might say, "Well, that's just a small thing." Small things add up. And knowing that you have someone with you, uh, knowing that they're people that are following your story. That's the other thing is with Rotary. If, if you're part of the Global Grant Scholar, you're, you're, they, they encourage you to really tell your story through, through a vlog or, or through um, to really get that, that story out there so that people can follow along. And knowing that people are keeping up to date, they're, they're, they're connecting with you, it, it makes you feel not so alone, which is, which is great when you, know, you graduate and you're off to a new country. It's, it can sometimes be a, a rough transition. And so... Um, Rotary has that, and the, and the fact that they're pretty much everywhere around the world means that wherever you go to study, you're you're pretty much guaranteed that that you're going to find a Rotarian who's who's willing to to kind of show you around, welcome you to their community. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, the the international connections uh, uh, through Rotary are just endless, and they they mm -hmm. are quite uh, unimaginable, and you never know. Uh, what kind of connections you're going to make and what networks uh, are, are will be established as a result of that. Let's move beyond your year of graduate studies in uh, in the UK and kind of bring uh, bring us up to date, if you would, please. Uh, wh what have you done uh, in your chosen career field uh, since you finished your uh, master's degree at Sussex? Yeah. So what what the master's degree allowed me to do is I, I actually was able to quickly kind of dive right into what I wanted to do. And I think that was really what Rodeo enabled me to do is to say, let's study this deeply. And now with that with that credentialing and with that understanding, dive straight into it. And so uh, right after pretty much concurrently while finishing my my master's, actually, I um, I I interned with the World Health Organization before the pandemic. And then as the pandemic started to unfold, I actually um, reached out to them. I, I interned in the, um, the emergency management unit. So within WHO, they have the emergency unit. And you might guess during the pandemic, which, which unit of the entire WHO is completely exploding, uh, is looking for people to get involved, has a ton of, of, of needs. It's the emergency management unit. So I reached out to my supervisor at the time, uh, who, I, who I had interned with. She said, great, let's let's get you involved immediately and was able to kind of start to, to get involved with WHO after graduating full time engagement all the way up till um, the end of the that that calendar year and um, was ho helping essentially monitoring the the public health and social measures. All, all of the measures that came out from from governments to say, what do we need to do to, to stop the spread of COVID? So I was involved in, in that regard. Um, in working with the WHO, in working within the UN system, I realized that to get an academic study and to get to work with the UN, I was a, it was more I was in a regional office. It was it was a bit detached from 
on the ground reality. And so I realized, you know, in order to really make the most of, of the learnings, the studies, and really to start to apply them, it requires getting on the ground. It requires living in the communities that you want to be working with. And so after right around that time, I, um, I moved to Rwanda and worked with an e-commerce startup called Dubai Ports World. Uh, their startup was called Dubai.com. Essentially, it was an e-commerce platform, kind of like Amazon, but for larger businesses. Was there for about six to seven months. And then during that time, um, came across a lot of extremely talented um, Rwandans, those who were tech savvy, coders, uh, marketers. And I thought to myself, there is there is a pocket of talent here. And there is so many opportunities in the U.S. for marketing and for coders. And really, the only thing that seems to be missing is, is just a link. And so that's when I, I founded Upsource during that time. Essentially, Upsource exists to connect, uh, to help train and connect talented Africans with digital work from around the world. And so um, we started that. I started that. That's probably two and a half years ago. Upsource is still going on. We still work with um, actually some organizations um, in Wisconsin, in Illinois, who, um, whether it's their social media or uh, there's something called a Google grant where you can really market yourself through, um, through Google searches. We still work with organizations there. After that period of time, I then um, moved to Malawi and then worked with a, um, a friend, a colleague, um, John Vanden Heuvel, and we founded Small Farm Cities. And so essentially what Small Farm Cities exists to do is we, we build agricultural communities um, that where people essentially can move ahead in life is, is essentially what we do. We build communities where people can start to move ahead. And the way that we do that, if you were to come to a small farm city, we'll, we'll show you a little bit. Of, I'll, I'll start to show some visuals, but essentially you're going to see greenhouses. You're going to see fish ponds. You're going to see affordable houses. And really what we do is we build these communities. It's, a, it's actually, this is for profit. The idea is that we want it to be for profit so that it's ultimately able to scale and to grow, not just to you know 10 or 100, but to tens of thousands. So it's a for profit company. We essentially people who work for us, they make money through the greenhouses or through the, the open field agriculture that they do through their farms. And then through that, they're actually able to, to pay for their house through a mortgage that we lend them. So we, we build the houses. We have carpenters and welders and plumbers on our team. We've been able to build houses for less than $1,000, which is, you know, that's, it's, it's, it only happens when you have economies of scale, when you're able to essentially work completely in-house. We make our own bricks. You really have to drive it. It took us about two years to get down to that cost. But we build the homes. We essentially, we finance the homes through a mortgage. And then the families are actually able to pay that off through the work that they do with us. And some of them actually, um, some of the spouse works, maybe one of them works for small farm cities, another one works outside. They're able to pay for that home and eventually become homeowners. Eventually then be able to, to own that home, store, store the value that they've created. And um, what's exciting about small farm cities then is that they benefit from the infrastructure that they all can basically communally invest in and, and benefit from. So we have Starlink Wi-Fi, wherever is able to benefit from hyper affordable Wi-Fi because everyone has invested in it. Uh, they're able to benefit from extremely clean drinking water because we all invested in a borehole and an above ground tank and a pump. And now everyone has clean water. We have communal bathrooms. So again, people can benefit from um, proper sanitation. And so when you have all of these things together, people benefit from economies of scale because now it's not one person selling tomatoes or growing tomatoes. It's an entire system that is hyper efficient and commercialized and putting out commercial output. And yet every individual is benefiting from that. And then they also can benefit from the shared infrastructure. And so it's a, there's a lot kind of going on with small farm cities. I'm actually at one right now. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm at um, our first site at Njewa. This site um, was initially built when I first came here about two and a half years ago. You see a fish pond right there. If we turn you around, these are some of the greenhouses we have. These are our smaller greenhouses. The uh, the commercial sizes that we now do are, are roughly about, uh, what would that be? They're roughly about six times as large as these ones. And so when you come, you see these fish ponds, you see these uh, greenhouses, and then you see these hyper affordable homes. We have Njewa, and then I'll, I'll show you maybe some pictures of our next site at Mpingu, which is a it's roughly 100 people who will be living in that community. And then our next site that we just broke ground on two months ago is at a place called Insaru, and that will roughly have a thousand people living in that community, living and working. And so 
we're really looking to scale this project up. If if it was simply to build a community of ten or hundred, that that's not really what that's not what we're about here. We're looking for scalable solutions, and so at Small Farm Cities, we like to bring a lot of solutions together. And so, you know, um, what I love about Rotary too is that when I've talked about Small Farm Cities, there's so many people involved at Rotary who are who are involved with work in Malawi or within uh, within Southern Africa, within Sub-Saharan Africa more broadly, and they say, I, I I do this thing. How does that fit into what you do? Is there a way to partner? And our answer is usually yes, because you, we, we're trying to bring, we bring solutions together at small farm cities. We, we want to bring in health. We want to bring in education. We want to bring in sanitation. And when we bring them all together into a community, the people in this community who are working hard, they're able to move because they're making money. They're getting educated. They're investing that money. Their kids are having a better life. Everyone's healthier and we can start to move ahead. So very briefly, Sorry, Larry, for going off, but I'm. Ex- you can tell I'm a bit excited about what we do. I'm passionate about it. It's absolutely clear that you're passionate about about what you're doing, and that's absolutely terrific. Um, uh, w- w- I do have ready uh, to to show a very short video from your U- Small Farm Cities YouTube uh, channel. So I'm going to bring it up uh, so that we can show it to our audience, and then you can uh, continue. I close my eyes. Sometimes I imagine a magical sunset against the silhouette of greenhouse full of fresh fruits and a light cool breeze against a sparkling pond full of tilapia. I imagine my son playing in green grass and my family sitting down to a healthy meal in a home I can call my own, in a community I helped to build. I imagine the possibilities. Now this is what I call fun. Welcome to Small Farm Cities Africa. We are a new generation of builders and entrepreneurs. We are professionals using advanced technologies, applying proven methods, blending aquaculture and agriculture with affordable housing into new systems and tangible assets that can store value and scale up across the nation. What I can imagine, I can now help build into a reality. Small Farm Cities is a for-profit venture a path to ownership and wealth creation that can endure. We are building a practical profit-oriented path to prosperity that will allow us to serve our neighbors, raise our families, innovate with new technologies, and secure the future. We welcome new partners here in our nation, across Africa and around the world, to work with us as we turn imagination to reality step by step. For more information, please visit our website at www.smallfarmcities.com. Okay, that gave a pretty good glimpse into what, what you're involved in. Uh, uh, yeah. Continue with uh, sharing. The one thing I love to share about that video is that, one, all of the footage is at Small Farm Cities. None of that was stock footage. It was all filmed on our, our two sites at the time, in Jewa and in Pingu. The other is all of the video editing, the voiceovers, was done by one of our guys as well. His name's Po. He's um he's our HR manager now. He had a background in film and cinematography, and he's moved into HR now because that was the the need. And he's he's been killing it as we've grown our company to, um, at this point over two hundred people. But he was the one the the mastermind behind that. And the other the other person you saw in there, um, who's been also really critical with our growth has been Sarah. She's the agronomist that you've seen there and so she's really helped us master the greenhouses the, the tomatoes that you saw in that video i mean we're talking about um on average last season we did about five metric tons a week of tomatoes we'll be moving up to around 10 metric tons um this this probably within march of this year and so we're talking again commercial scale this isn't um you know just a small farm we we say small farm cities, and really the idea with that is that it's it's not small in terms of scale or in terms of production. It's small in the sense that with a small piece of land on, on a hyper, if you hyper concentrate agriculture and home ownership, people can move ahead. You don't need to have these large commercial farms um, to really make that happen. It, in, in Malawi, these small plots, when someone can own them, when someone can be investing in them, they can really be be leveraged and they can help people move ahead. So we're excited about that video. A lot has changed since then, which is super exciting. Um, but yeah, I, I, all to say, I, I don't, I, if you want to learn more, I think maybe go to smallfarmcities.com, www, 
www.smallfarmcities.com. On there, you'll see kind of our scale up, how we go from a site of 10 to 100 to 1,000, and really our ambitions to start to scale up um, to, to tens of thousands is what we're talking about now, where you can have modular approaches, where you can do a community of 100. You could do a community of 1,000 here and here and here, and they, they work independently. They'll work because essentially what we've done, what our team has been able to create is, is a system solution. All of the kind of the intellectual property, all of the, the ways that we operate, all of the, whether it's the greenhouse or the construction method or the financing or the HR, really what we want to do is in many ways franchise, to grow it in a way that can, can scale up, um, as we said, across the nation. And so we're excited about what we're doing here. I would say it fits perfectly, I think, with Rotary and Rotary really has enabled it to happen because I think the vision is the same. Rotary is it's a group of people coming together from various backgrounds who say to themselves, look, I want to make my community better and I want to make communities around the world better. And at Small Farm Cities, that's we start with community as well. We say, look, we all come from different backgrounds. And for us to work well, for us to succeed as a community, we need agronomy. We need affordable housing. We need water and sanitation. We need hygiene. We need to bring these all together so that we can all advance. You know, if you have all of these things, if you have everything, but you have poor health, are you really going to be able to advance? If you have everything, but you can't continue to get your education, how far can you go? If you have a, you know, a great job and you're making a lot of money, but in Malawi, you have devaluation. That money loses value every day. Since I've been here, the kwacha, it was 1,000 to one. 1,000 kwacha equals a dollar. Now, essentially, it's 2,000 to one. Since I've been here, the value of that, that currency that you've had or the bank that you've had has gone in half. And so it's not enough even to have a good job. You need a way to invest your money, to grow your money, so you stay ahead of that. And so I love what Rotary is doing. I love the Global Grant Scholarship because, again, it's, it's systems. It's people from all these backgrounds, from all these expertise coming together to say, let's solve these issues. And so and then in that way, I'm very thankful for the Global Grant Scholarship for allowing me to get here, for instilling that mindset, for connecting me with like-minded people. I'm excited to see even where we go, where um, – Whoever's listening, if anyone's interested, you know, we're, we're excited to collaborate. We're excited to keep growing this um, because ultimately we know we're stronger together. We know that we're stronger when experts from their various fields come together and make this community uh, an even ex more exciting place. Thanks uh, again for sharing your passion. If uh, a local Rotary Club or even a Rotary District uh, might be interested in having you make a presentation Obviously, it would have to be by Zoom unless you happen to be back in uh, Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, would you be willing to make presentations? And if, if so, how would they contact you? Love, I love sharing uh, about Rotary, the Global Grant Scholarship, and then also you know what we're what we're doing here at Small Farm Cities and what we're doing with Upsource. So, would love to. Uh, the best way is through email. Um, it's L E I F Leif dot and then it's a, it's a dutch last name van grinsven it's v-a-n-g-r-i-n-s-v-e-n at gmail.com so it's leif dot van grinsven if my name appears if you see leif van grinsven it's leif dot van grinsven no spaces at gmail.com um feel free to reach out and would love to would love to to share about what we're doing would love to to get involved with any rotary uh, club that wants to speak okay terrific they of course have to be sensitive to the eight hour time difference with the, <clears throat> with the central time. Yes. So how would you compare uh, the Rotary Global Grant Scholarship uh, with other scholarships or grants or fellowships with which uh, you might be acquainted? Yeah, I, I've had, um, again, other, other scholarships and fellowships. I think the difference I would say goes back to um, connection. I mean, the most consistent, I'm, I'm still engaging with you, Larry, and it was 2019 and 2020, and we're in 2024, right? I mean, that, that in and of itself shows, I think, the relational side of, of what Rotary has compared to, to maybe other ones, where it's, it's, it's a long-term engagement. It's something where because you share the same vision, because you share the same passion, essentially it's like it's bringing people together, and you, why, why would you separate, right? If, you, if you're all trying to go the same way, if you're all trying to tackle the same issues, why are you going to go? Why, why would you not stay connected? And so I would say that the shared vision with Rotary is something that's very unique. Um, and then I would also say the long-term desire to be connected from, from both ends. If you're, if you're going into the Global Grant Scholarship, 
I think that's a that's a core kind of characteristic that that you some that Rotary is looking for. And from the Rotary side, they want to continue to engage. But this is not simply a one-off, but it's really an investment for your career to say, you know, what you're doing, we we want to be involved in and and I'm there's many probably opportunities to continue to collaborate and eventually to, to be part of Rotary and in the community that you're in to continue to do and support the those you know community transforming projects that that we're all excited about. Okay, thank you. Um, well, toward the beginning of this interview, you hinted at what I think you're going to answer to uh, the the last question. But what advice would you then have for anyone who might be interested in applying uh, for a global grant scholarship? Yeah. Um... I think the the most important is to know what you want to do, and 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 you know if you're graduating college, if you're still in college, if you've just graduated, you're a couple of years out. It doesn't mean having your complete life together, but it means having enough focus on what you're passionate about, what you want to be dedicating your life towards. That Rotary can look at you and say, "Look, I think we're aligned in that," and so. You know, I, I wouldn't put the pressure to say, what's your 10 year plan? What's your five year plan? Having that is great, but it's more to say, have you shown a, a dedication to a specific area that you care about in your past? And, and do you have confidence that you can continue to pursue that? And so before applying, I think the best advice is always to reflect. If, if you still are trying to figure it out, that's great. Rotary can maybe be a piece in that puzzle where it's, it helps give you clarity, but it shouldn't be the end all be all. You're not applying for the global grant to get the global grant, and that's that's kind of the end of the the, the mission. Really, this is a, a a launch. It's supposed to launch you into where you want to go. And so, what I would say is, start to figure that out. What's your vision after this this you know this university experience that you've had? Where where are you going with this PhD? Where, where are you going with that? And what are you trying to solve? And if you have that very clear, then I think the application and the whole process becomes so much easier because suddenly. It's not trying to fit the global grant into your career. It's to say, this is where I'm going. And this is just, it's a, it would accelerate it tremendously. And so with or without, it's like, this is where I want to go, but this would really make it, you know, work so much better. And, and in my case, it's been a huge blessing where it, I think I, this is where I want to go and, and this will make it just so much better. And, and it really has. Hey, thank you for that advice. It is also a fact that when uh, our subcommittee that I chair interviews uh, applicants, it's a, precisely what you just shared uh, is, is what we use as a primary criterion for um, selecting those who receive the Global Grant Scholarship. So uh, knowing what you want to do and demonstrating how it fits into one of Rotary's seven areas of focus. Any final words today? Um, I would just say thank you to Rotary. Um, for that, first and foremost, um, to be here is is Rotary has been part of that. Um, this this sort of this career path I've been on um, for small farm cities um, and Upsource. Please reach out. I'd love to share more. I'd love to share more about the Global Grants Scholarship. About uh, you know my my path with Rotary and, and what we're doing here. We're always eager to to engage and to again strengthen what we're doing. I'm not an agronomist. I'm not a finance uh, guy. I'm not a, a health person. I've, I've just kind of managed to help kind of bring these together at Small Farm Cities. And so we like those people. We really like the health people. We love the finance people. We like the the uh, the teachers because ultimately that's that's what a community is made of. And if we can create a place where, you know, people can use their gifts to the best of their ability, then then we're, we're happy about that. So, um, yeah, uh, if anyone's interested, please reach out to me. I'd love to share more. Um, but again, thank you. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, Rotary, for making this, making kind of what you see here, I mean, making that possible, so. Well, thank you for who you are and what you do. Uh, thank you for spending uh, time with us today to explain your experience with the Global Grant Scholarship Program and uh, explaining to what it has led you and, and what, what you're involved in right now. Uh, we are very proud of you. Please know that uh, you are and will be a blessing to many. And we continue to hope and pray that that will be so for many, many years to come. So thank you very much for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Larry. My pleasure.